planet Earth is comprised of 70% water. In those waters, there are tons of living creatures, both already discovered and those who are, as of yet, undiscovered. One of the most feared predators in the ocean is both dangerous and misunderstood, the eating machine known as the shark. Time to get in our protective cages and dive down to get up close with shark attacks. Jaws of the Deep Shark attacks are classified as an attack on a human by a shark. Every year, around 80 unprovoked attacks are reported worldwide. Despite their relative rarity, many people fear shark attacks after occasional serial attacks, such as the Jersey Shore attacks of 1916, and horror fiction and films such as the Draws series. Out of more than 489 shark species, only three are responsible for a double-digit number of fatal, unprovoked attacks on humans the great white, tiger, and boar. The oceanic white tip has probably killed more castaways, but these are not recorded in the statistics. According to the ISAF, the International Shark Attack File, between 1958 and 2016, there were 2,785 confirmed unprovoked shark attacks around the world, of which 439 were fatal. In 2000, there were 79 shark attacks reported worldwide, 11 of them fatal. In 2005 and 2006, this number decreased to 61 and 62 respectively, while the number of fatalities dropped to only 4 per year. The 2016 yearly total of 81 shark attacks worldwide was on par with the most recent 5-year 2011 to 2015 average of 82 incidents annually. By contrast, the 98 shark attacks in 2015 was the highest yearly total on record. There were four fatalities worldwide in 2016, which is lower than the average of eight fatalities per year worldwide. In the 2011-2015 period, and six deaths per annum over the past decade. In 2016, 58% of attacks were on surfers. Despite these reports, however, the actual number of fatal shark attacks worldwide remains uncertain. For the majority of third world coastal nations, there exists no method of reporting suspected shark attacks. Therefore, losses and fatalities near shore or at sea often remain unsolved or unpublicized. Of these attacks, the majority occurred in the United States, 53 in 2000, 40 in 2005 and 39 in 2006. The New York Times reported in July 2008 that there had been only one fatal attack in the previous year. On average, there are 16 shark attacks per year in the United States, with one fatality every two years. According to the ISAF, the US states in which the most attacks have occurred are Florida, Hawaii, California, Texas and the Carolinas, though attacks have occurred in almost every coastal state. Australia has the highest number of fatal shark attacks in the world, with Western Australia recently becoming the deadliest place in the world for shark attacks, with total and fatal shark bites growing exponentially over the last 40 years. Since 2000, there have been 15 fatal shark attacks along the West Australian coast, with divers now facing odds of 1 in 16,000 for a fatal shark bite. Other shark attack hotspots include Reunion Island, Boa Viagam in Brazil, Makena Beach, Maui, Hawaii, and Second Beach, Port St. John's, South Africa. South Africa has a high number of shark attacks along with a high fatality rate of 27%. As of June 28, 1992, Recife in Brazil began officially registering shark attacks on its beaches, mainly on the beach of Boa Viagam. Over more than two decades, 62 victims were attacked, of which 24 died. The last deadly attack occurred on July 22, 2013. The attacks were caused by the species bull shark and tiger shark. What shocks about the shark attacks in Recife is that so many of them are fatal. 21 of the 56, a death rate of about 37%. This is much higher than the worldwide shark attack fatality rate, which is currently about 16%, according to Florida State Museum of Natural History. The location with the most recorded shark attacks is New Smyrna Beach, Florida. Developed nations such as the United States, Australia and to some extent South Africa facilitate more thorough documentation of shark attacks on humans than developing coastal nations. The increased use of technology has enabled Australia and the United States to record more data than other nations, which could somewhat bias the results recorded. 
In addition to this, individuals and institutions in South Africa, the US and Australia keep a file which is regularly updated by an entire research team, the International Shark Attack File and the Australian Shark Attack File. The Florida Museum of Natural History compares these statistics with the much higher rate of deaths from other causes. For example, an average of more than 38 people die annually from lightning strikes in coastal states, while less than one person per year is killed by a shark in Florida. In the United States, even considering only people who go to beaches, a person's chance of getting attacked by a shark is 1 in 11.5 million, and a person's chance of getting killed by a shark is less than 1 in 264.1 million. However, in certain situations, the risk of a shark attack are higher. For example, in the southwest of West Australia, the chances of a surfer having a fatal shark bite in winter or spring are 1 in 40,000, and for divers, it is 1 in 16,000. In comparison to the risk of a serious or fatal cycling accident, this represents three times the risk for a surfer and seven times the risk for a diver. In rare circumstances, such as bad visibility, black tips may bite humans, mistaking them for prey. Under normal conditions, however, they are harmless and often even quite shy. As we mentioned earlier, only a few species of shark are dangerous to humans. Out of more than 480 shark species, only three are responsible for two-digit numbers of fatal, unprovoked attacks on humans – the great white, tiger and bull. However, the oceanic white tip has probably killed more castaways which may not have been recorded in the statistics. These sharks, being large, powerful predators, may sometimes attack and kill people. However, they have all been filmed in open water by unprotected divers. The 2010 French film Oceans shows footage of humans swimming next to sharks in the ocean. It is possible that the sharks are able to sense the presence of unnatural elements on or about the divers, such as polyurethane diving suits and air tanks, which may lead them to accept temporary outsiders as more of a curiosity than prey. Uncostumed humans, however, such as those surfboarding, light snorkeling or swimming, present a much greater area of exposed skin surface to sharks. In addition, the presence of even small traces of blood, recent minor abrasions, cuts, scrapes or bruises may lead sharks to attack a human in their environment. Sharks seek out prey through electroreception, sensing the electric fields that are generated by all animals due to the activity of their nerves and muscles. Most of the oceanic white tips shark attacks have not been recorded, unlike the other three species mentioned above. Famed oceanographic researcher Jacques Cousteau described the oceanic white tip as the most dangerous of all sharks. Watson and the Shark by J.S. Copley, based on the attack on Brooke Watson in Havana Harbor in 1749. Modern day statistics show the oceanic white tip shark as seldom being involved in unprovoked attacks. However, there have been a number of attacks involving this species, particularly during World War I and World War II. The oceanic white tip lives in the ocean sea and rarely shows up near coasts, where most recorded incidents occur. During the World Wars, many ship and aircraft disasters happened in the open ocean, and because of its former abundance, the oceanic white tip was often the first species on site when such a disaster happened. Infamous examples of oceanic white tip attacks include the sinking of the Nova Scotia, a British steamship carrying 1,000 people that was torpedoed by a German submarine on November 18, 1942, near South Africa. Only 192 people survived, with many deaths attributed to the oceanic white tip shark. The same species is believed to have been responsible for many of the 60 to 80 or more shark casualties following the torpedoing of the USS Indianapolis on July 30, 1945. Black December refers to at least nine shark attacks on humans, causing six deaths that occurred along the coast of KwaZulu-Natal province, South Africa, from December 18, 1957 to April 5, 1958. In addition to the four species responsible for a significant number of fatal attacks on humans, a number of other species have attacked humans without being provoked and have, on extremely rare occasions, been responsible for a human death. This group includes the shortfin, mako, hammerhead, galapagos, grey reef, blacktip, lemon, silky shark and blue sharks. These sharks are also large, powerful predators, which can be provoked simply by being in the water at the wrong time and place, but they are normally considered less dangerous to humans than the previous group. On the evening of the 16th of March 2009, a new addition was made to the list of sharks known to have attacked human beings. 
in a painful but not directly life-threatening incident, a long-distance swimmer crossing the Alenui Haha Channel between the islands of Hawaii and Maui was attacked by a cookie-cutter shark. The two bites, delivered about 15 seconds apart, were not immediately life-threatening. Shark attack indices use different criteria to determine if an attack was provoked or unprovoked. When considered from the shark's point of view, attacks on humans who are perceived as a threat to the shark or a competitor to its food source are all provoked attacks. Neither the International Shark Attack File nor the GSAF, the Global Shark Attack File, accord casualties of air sea disasters provoked or unprovoked status. These incidents are considered to be a separate category. Post-mortem scavenging of human remains, typically drowning victims, are also not accorded provoked or unprovoked status. The GSAF categorizes scavenging bites on humans as questionable incidents. The most common criteria for determining provoked and unprovoked attacks are as follows. Provoked attacks occur when a human touches, hooks, nets or otherwise aggravates the animal. Incidents that occur outside of a shark's natural habitat, such as aquariums and research holding pens, are considered provoked, as are all incidents involving captured sharks. Sometimes humans inadvertently provoke an attack, such as when a surfer accidentally hits a shark with a surfboard. Unprovoked attacks are initiated by the shark. They occur in a shark's natural habitat on a live human and without human provocation. There are three subcategories of unprovoked attack. Hit and run attack, usually non-fatal. The shark bites and then leaves. Most victims do not see the shark. This is the most common type of attack and typically occurs in the surf zone or in murky water. Most hit and run attacks are believed to be the result of mistaken identity. Sneak attack. The victim will not usually see the shark and may sustain multiple deep bites. This kind of attack is predatory in nature and is often carried out with the intention of consuming the victim. It is extraordinarily rare for this to occur. Bump and bite attack. The shark circles and bumps the victim before biting. Great whites are known to do this on occasion, referred to as a test bite, in which the great white is attempting to identify what is being bitten. Repeated bites, depending on the reaction of the victim, thrashing or panicking may lead the shark to believe the victim is prey. They are not uncommon and can be severe or fatal. Bump and bite attacks are not believed to be the result of mistaken identity. An incident occurred in 2011 when a three meter long great white shark jumped onto a seven person research vessel off Seal Island, South Africa. The crew were undertaking a population study using sardines as bait and the incident was judged to be an accident. Large shark species are apex predators in their environment and thus have little fear of any creature other than orcas with which they cross paths. Like most sophisticated hunters, they are curious when they encounter something unusual in their territories. Lacking any limbs with sensitive digits such as hands or feet, the only way they can explore an object or organism is to bite it. These bites are known as test bites. Generally, shark bites are exploratory and the animal will swim away after one bite. For example, exploratory bites on surfers are thought to be caused by the shark mistaking the surfer and surfboard for the shape of prey. Nonetheless, a single bite can grievously injure a human if the animal involved is a powerful predator such as a great white or tiger shark. Feeding is not the reason sharks attack humans. In fact, humans do not provide enough high-fat meat for sharks, which need a lot of energy to power their large muscular bodies. A shark will normally make one swift attack and then retreat to wait for the victim to die or weaken from shock and blood loss before returning to feed. This protects the shark from injury from a wounded and aggressive target. However, it also allows humans time to get out of the water and survive. Shark attacks may also occur due to territorial reasons or as dominance over another shark species resulting in an attack. Sharks are equipped with sensory organs called the ampullae of Lorenzi that detect the electricity generated by muscle movement. The shark's electrical receptors, which pick up movement, detect signals like those emitted from fish wounded. For example, by someone who is spearfishing, leading the shark to attack the person by mistake. George H. Burgess, director of the International Shark Attack File, said the following regarding why people are attacked. Attacks are basically an odds game based on how many hours you are in the water. Over the years, several different methods have been employed the world over to prevent shark attacks. 
In Australia and South Africa, shark nets are used to reduce the risk of shark attack. Since 1936, shark nets have been utilized off Sydney beaches. Shark nets are currently installed at beaches in New South Wales and Queensland. 83 beaches are meshed in Queensland compared with 51 in New South Wales. Since 1952, nets have been installed at numerous beaches in South Africa by the KwaZulu Natal Sharks Board. Shark nets do not offer complete protection but work on the principle of fewer sharks, fewer attacks. They reduce occurrence via shark mortality. Shark nets such as those in New South Wales are designed to entangle and kill sharks and other animals that pass near them. Reducing the local shark populations is believed to reduce the chance of an attack. Historical shark attack figures suggest that the use of shark nets and drumlines does markedly reduce the incidence of shark attack when implemented on a regular and consistent basis. However, it has been argued that shark nets do not protect swimmers. The downside with shark nets is that they do result in bycatch, including threatened and endangered species. Between September 2017 and April 2018, 403 animals were killed in the nets in New South Wales, including 10 critically endangered grey nurse sharks, 7 dolphins, 7 green sea turtles and 14 great white sharks. Between 1950 and 2008, 352 tiger sharks and 577 great white sharks were killed in the nets in New South Wales. Also, during this period, a total of 15,135 marine animals were killed in the nets, including whales, turtles, rays, dolphins and dugongs. KwaZulu-Natal's net program, operated by the KwaZulu-Natal Sharks Board, has killed more than 33,000 sharks in a 30-year period. During the same 30-year period, 2,211 turtles, 8,448 rays and 2,310 dolphins were killed in KwaZulu-Natal. Shark nets have been criticized by environmentalists, scientists and conservationists. They say shark nets harm the marine ecosystem. In particular, the current net program in New South Wales has been described as being extremely destructive to marine life. Sharks are important to the ecosystem and killing them harms the ecosystem. Used to lure and capture large sharks using baited hooks. In some places, such as Queensland, the sharks are killed. Drumlines are typically deployed near popular swimming beaches with the intention of reducing the number of sharks in the vicinity and therefore the probability of shark attack. Drumlines were first deployed in Queensland, Australia in 1962. During this time, they were just as successful in reducing the frequency of shark attacks as the shark nets. More recently, drumlines have also been used with great success in Recife, Brazil, where the number of attacks has been shown to have reduced by 97% when the drumlines are deployed. The purpose of the Recife program was to relocate sharks. Drumlines are currently used in Queensland. Between 2001 and 2018, a total of 10,480 sharks were killed on lethal drumlines in Queensland as part of a shark cull. Between 1962 and 2018, roughly 50,000 sharks were killed by Queensland authorities. Drumlines result in bycatch. For example, in 2015, the following was said about Queensland's shark control program, which uses drumlines. Data reveals the ecological carnage of Queensland's shark control regime. In total, more than 8,000 marine species with some level of protection status have been caught by the Queensland Shark Control Program, including 719 loggerhead turtles, 442 manta rays and 33 critically endangered hawksbill turtles. More than 84,000 marine animals have been ensnared by drumlines and shark nets since the program began in 1962. Nearly 27,000 marine animals have been snared. The state's shark control policy has captured over 5,000 turtles, 1,014 dolphins, nearly 700 dugongs and 120 whales. Drumlines have been criticized by environmentalists, conservationists and animal welfare activists. They say drumlines are unethical, non-scientific and environmentally destructive. They also say drumlines harm the marine ecosystem. The current drumline program in Queensland has also been called outdated, cruel and ineffective. Beach patrols and spotter aircraft are commonly used to protect popular swimming beaches. However, aerial patrols have a limited effectiveness in reducing shark attacks. Other methods include shark tagging efforts and associated tracking and notification systems, capture and translocation of sharks to offshore waters, research into shark feeding and foraging behavior, 
Public threat education programs and encouraging higher risk user groups, surfers, spearfishers and divers to use personal shark protection technology. The Jersey Shore shark attacks of 1916 killed four people in the first two weeks of July 1916 along the New Jersey Shore and Matawan Creek in New Jersey. They are generally credited as the beginning of media attention on shark attacks in the United States of America. In 2010, nine Australian survivors of shark attacks banded together to promote a more positive view of sharks. The survivors made particular note of the role of the media in distorting the fear of sharks. Films such as Jaws were the cause of large-scale hunting and killing of thousands of sharks. Jaws had a significant impact on people and gave them an unrealistic view of sharks, causing them to fear them more than they probably should. The media has continued to exploit this fear over the years by sensationalizing attacks and portraying sharks as vicious man-eaters. There are some television shows, such as the famous Shark Week, that are dedicated to the preservation of these animals. They are able to prove through scientific studies that sharks are not interested in attacking humans and generally mistake humans as prey. Let's take a look at some of the most famous shark attacks on record. George Coulthard was an Australian cricketer and Australian rules footballer. Following the matches against Carlton, the Waratahs adopted Australian rules and for a time the colonial game threatened to supersede rugby in Sydney. Coulthard accepted an invitation from Phil Sheridan, a trustee of the Sydney cricket ground, to travel to Sydney with the aim of fostering Australian rules in the city. On September 15, 1877, soon after his arrival, Coulthard joined several local footballers on a fishing trip in Sydney Harbour. The group was anchored near Shark Island when Coulthard, sitting on the boat's gunwale with the back of his tailcoat hanging over the side, was pushed overboard by a monster shark 13 feet long. The shark had seized his coattails trailing on the water and dragged him beneath the surface some 10 or 12 feet until it tore the coat from his body. After kicking up the shark, Coulthard swam to the surface alongside the boat, into which he threw with the aid of his friends a kind of somersault, just about as quickly as he had been taken overboard. The incident was said to be one of the most marvellous escapes from a fearful death on record and probably without parallel in Australian waters. Shaken by the event, Coulthard returned to Melbourne within a week, where he resumed playing for Carlton. The club denied widely circulated rumours that it had lured its star player back with financial incentives, stating that Coulthard returned due to a falling out with his associates in Sydney. Nonetheless, the shark entered sporting folklore as the reason why Coulthard abandoned his plans in Sydney, which, as the story goes, kept Australian rules from becoming the city's most popular football code. Rodney Winston Fox is a South Australian filmmaker, conservationist, survivor of an attack by a great white shark and one of the world's foremost authorities on that species. Fox was attacked by a great white shark while spearfishing and badly bitten around the chest and arm in December 1963. His story of the attack and escape has been published many times. He is regarded as a miracle survivor of one of the world's worst non-fatal shark attacks. In the attack, Fox's abdomen was fully exposed and all his ribs were broken on his left-hand side. His diaphragm was punctured, his lung was ripped open, his scapula was pierced, his spleen was uncovered, his artery was exposed and he was minutes away from his veins collapsing due to the loss of large amounts of blood. The tendons, fingers and thumb in his right hand were all cut and to this day he has part of a shark tooth embedded in his wrist. His wounds required 462 stitches after the attack. Fox went on to design and build the first underwater observation cage to dive with the great white shark and for over 40 years has led major expeditions to film and study his attacker. He arranged and hosted the very first great white shark expedition to welcome sport divers and has run hundreds of expeditions in the 30 years since. Fox is regarded as a world authority on the great white shark and has a great reputation as an expedition leader and producer of shark documentaries. He has been involved in some way with most great white shark films made in the 20th century. He has hosted expeditions for over 100 major feature and documentary films with filmmakers and shark researchers from 16 different countries. Disney, Universal, IMAX, Cousteau Society and National Geographic have enlisted his help and filmed and studied the great white shark from his cages. Fox's life since the attack has involved consulting and coordinating film crews and arranging and guiding ecotourism adventure trips and expeditions specializing in great white sharks and other marine creatures. He also travels the world giving talks to people about his experiences with sharks and the need for conservation efforts to continue. 
His talks and films on the Great White Shark have educated swimmers and divers to the realistic potential of a shark attack. He delivers a firm message that sharks are not all that bad, we have very few confrontations with them, and we should look after all our fishes, especially the Great White. He positions it as an important keystone predator, directly controlling the diversity and abundance of other species in the great web of life. In 2009, Fox was nominated for the 2010 Indianapolis Prize, the world's largest individual monetary award for animal species conservation. He was inducted into the International Scuba Diving Hall of Fame in 2007. Bethany Mailani Hamilton Dirks is an American professional surfer who survived a 2003 shark attack in which her left arm was bitten off, but who ultimately returned to professional surfing. She wrote about her experience in the 2004 autobiography Soul Surfer, a true story of faith, family, and fighting to get back on the board. In April 2011, the feature film Soul Surfer was released. On October 31, 2003, Hamilton, aged 13 at the time, went for a morning surf along Tunnels Beach, Kauai, with her best friend Alana Blanchard, Alana's father Holt, and brother Byron, when a 14-foot-long tiger shark attacked her, severing her left arm just below the shoulder. The Blanchards helped paddle her back to shore. Then, Alana's father fashioned a tourniquet out of a rash guard and wrapped it around the stump of her arm. She was rushed to Wilcox Memorial Hospital. By the time she arrived there, she had lost over 60% of her blood and was in hypovolemic shock. A doctor living in a hotel nearby raced to the rescue. Her father, who was scheduled to have knee surgery that same morning, was already there, but she took his place in the operating room. Bethany was back in the water within three to four weeks of the attack. During subsequent media interviews, she confirmed that she felt normal when she was bitten and did not feel much pain from the bite at the moment of the disaster, but felt numb on the way to hospital. When the news broke out of the shark attack, a family of fishermen led by Ralph Young presented to investigators photos of a 14-foot-long tiger shark they had caught and killed about one mile from the attack site. It had surfboard debris in its mouth. When measurements of its mouth were compared with those of Hamilton's broken board, it matched. In late 2004, the police officially confirmed that it was the same one that had attacked her. Despite the trauma of the incident, Hamilton was determined to return to surfing. One month after the attack, she returned to her board. Initially, she adopted a custom-made board that was longer and slightly thicker than standard and had a handle for her right arm, making it easier to paddle, and she learned to kick more to make up for the loss of her left arm. After teaching herself to surf with one arm, on January 10, 2004, she entered a major competition. She now uses standard competitive performance shortboards. The shark and surfboard that Hamilton was riding during the attack as well as the bathing suit she was wearing at the time, a gift from ocean photographer Aaron Shang, are on display at the California Surf Museum in Oceanside, California. Mathieu Schiller was a French bodyboarder. Crowned French champion in 1993, he later won the team event of the European Championships in 1995. He died in a shark attack off Saint-Gilles Reunion. The attack was likely caused by a tiger shark or bull shark. His body was not recovered. Sir Brooke Watson, first baronet, was a British merchant, soldier, and later Lord Mayor of London. He is perhaps most famous as the subject of John Singleton Copley's painting, Watson and the Shark, which depicts a shark attack on Watson as a boy that resulted in the loss of his right leg below the knee. Watson was the only son of John Watson and Sarah Watson. Born in Plymouth, Devon in 1735, he was orphaned in 1741 and sent to live with his aunt and uncle in Boston, Massachusetts. His uncle was a merchant who traded in the West Indies. Before the age of 14, Watson had expressed his interest in the sea, so his uncle signed him up as a crew member on one of his merchant ships. While swimming alone in Havana Harbor, Cuba, in 1749, the 14-year-old Watson was attacked by a shark. The shark attacked twice before Watson was rescued. The first time, the shark removed flesh from below the calf of Watson's right leg. The second time, it bit off his right foot at the ankle. Watson was rescued by his shipmates, but his leg had to be amputated below the knee. Watson recuperated in a Cuban hospital and recovered within three months. Michael Eugene Fanning, AO, nicknamed White Lightning, is a former Australian professional surfer. Fanning won the 2007, 2009 and 2013 ASP World Tour. In 2015, he survived an encounter with what is suspected to be a great white shark during the J-Bay Open Finals in Jeffreys Bay, South Africa. On 
the 19th of July 2015, Fanning encountered a shark two minutes into the J-Bay Open 2015 finals at Jefferies Bay, South Africa. On the 19th of July 2015, Fanning encountered a shark two minutes into the J-Bay Open 2015 finals at Jefferies Bay, South Africa. Fanning was in the water with Julian Wilson during the final when what was suspected to be a great white shark swam next to him. Fanning punched the shark and tried to wedge his board between the shark and his body. The shark eventually bit off Fanning's leash and Fanning started to attempt to flee back to the shore. Wilson paddled towards Fanning to assist him and was praised for his action and hailed as a hero. Much of the early coverage characterized the encounter as a shark attack. Based on analysis of the video and the fact that Fanning was not bitten, some marine biologists believe the shark had no intention of biting him. A response team quickly rescued him from any further danger by scaring the shark away with a boat and picking up both Fanning and Wilson, who were still in the water nearby. Both surfers escaped unharmed and were given a shared victory, splitting the prize money. Following the ordeal, Wilson gave a tear-filled interview. When he was asked, you guys are locked in a title battle right now, and to put things into perspective, does that mean anything to you at this point in time? Wilson replied, no, not at all, I'm just happy he's alive. The event was cancelled. The next day, Fanning returned to Australia. He wondered why the shark did not bite him and told reporters, I'm just lucky, it wasn't my time. The story received international news coverage. Fanning returned to the water to surf again less than a week later, dedicating it to his late brother, and also surfed Shipstone Bluff on August the 27th, a break notorious for great white sharks. Fanning later completed in the Billabong Pro T Hoopoo, which took place in August 2015 in Tahiti. Fanning would go on to take victory at the Hurley Pro at Trestles Beach and finish the year second in the ratings.